All right, so today I'm either going to do one of two things. I'm going to help clear something up for you, or I'm going to make it even muddier than it was. Probably the second one, so you guys got to bear with me. We're going to be in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Working out your salvation. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So anytime you're reading through the word and you see the word therefore, or maybe like since then or so that, you need to ask yourself, what is it there for? Because what it's doing is it's connecting a previous thought to what we're going to be talking about. And so if you remember for the last, I don't know how long we've been in Philippians, the last couple months, what Paul's been talking about is he's been um, encouraging the church and, and exhorting or urging them to remain humble, to be united, one spirit, one mind, one body. And, and then what he does is he sets that up and then he gives the greatest example in history of humility. And that's in Jesus Christ, the kenosis passage or the Christ hymn, which Darren just got finished preaching on for two weeks. So we look at this therefore, and, and Paul is really setting this church up, I think, because he says, therefore, right after this Christ hymn, he, therefore, since Christ humbled himself to the point of death for your salvation, right, therefore, since Christ did this, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. And I was thinking, how in the world could the Philippian church respond to this? He said, look at what Jesus just did for you. And so because of that, you should do this. And I was thinking about it, and it would be like, if say me and Laurie were at the beach, and we're in the water, and this huge, like, 30-foot great white shark is coming at her, right? And I jump in the way, and I fight off this shark to save her, but I lose my arm in the process. Right, but she gets out, she, you know, no scratches, nothing, she's good, but I lose my arm. And then like 25 or 30 years later, because that's about how long this book was written since Christ died, about 25, 30 years later, I walk up to her and I have a, a jar of pickles in my hand, right? And I say, look, Laurie, be my beloved, babe, look, since I lost my arm saving your life from a shark, do you think that you could open this for me? What is she going to say? She's not going to say no. I, only have, I lost my ability to open a jar of pickles for her. And so I really feel like Paul's kind of setting them up, saying, look, Christ did this for you. And so since you have obeyed me before, continue to obey me. And now remember, he's talking to believers here. So these people actually believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he died for their sins and rose again. He's not talking to the whole world. He's talking to believers. And what we see is he's, he's encouraging them, encouraging them, and exhorting them at the same time. So look at the wording. Is my beloved, as you have always obeyed. He's, he's encouraging them. He's building them up. You know, I, when I go home, if, if I want Laurie to do something for me, I don't say this. I don't say, woman, I don't care what you've done. I need you to go do more. Right? I do not say that. I may have once and she probably would have hit me for it. Right? So I don't say that. But I would go home and I would encourage her and I would build her up. And saying, look, you know, I don't, I don't call her my beloved or my love, but I'll say something like, babe, you, you have been doing so awesome taking care of the kids and the house and, and I, you know, just keep pushing forward. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. And so that's what we see here from Paul. He's encouraging them. But then he goes right into his exhortation where he's urging them to do something. He says, but much more in my absence. So as you have always obeyed, but much more in my absence. He wants them to obey him. And so Paul's talking with some authority here. And this isn't the only time that we see Paul talking with authority. If you look in 1 Corinthians 4, 18 through 21, he says, Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod, or with love, and a spirit of gentleness? Paul's saying, look, you got two options. When I come to you, I can come in love or I can come with a rod and we can throw down, right? That's, that's what he's saying. He's talking with authority. He has authority over that church. And you see the same thing in Philemon. Verse 8 says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. 
So Paul's talking with some authority and he's telling them, just as you've always obeyed, obey me. What does he want them to obey? It's not like he's going around telling them, well, I only like Dunkin' Donuts, so I don't want anybody to drink Starbucks coffee, right? If you're going to be part of this church, Dunkin' Donuts coffee only, that's it, right? Or when you come in, you have to wear a suit and a tie, or you have to use this Bible. That's not what we see Paul doing, right? Paul's not encouraging them or, I guess, standing over them, telling them that they have to obey his preferences, right? He's telling them, I want you to obey my teaching, the gospel teaching that I have been presenting to you, that I brought to you and started this church with, right? Follow me or imitate me as I imitate Christ, as we see in 1 Corinthians 11, right? Don't, it's not imitate my clothing. No, I'm imitating Christ, so look at me. Obey the word that I have given you about the Lord. And he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So point number one, point number one on your bulletin is you are responsible for your salvation. Now that may cause a little bit of you, or a few of you to kind of be like, what did you just say? So just, just give me a second. But you are responsible for your salvation. So it's work out your salvation. Let me tell you what this does not say. This does not say work for your salvation or work to obtain your salvation. That's not what it's saying. And I'm going to make that argument that it's not saying that from several other verses. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. John six forty four, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Romans 3, 23 through 24, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So if we're called to work out our salvation... What does he mean when he says salvation? And so what we need to do is figure that out. Because there's some debate here. People are saying, well, no, he's saying you need to work for your salvation. But he's not. So let's look at this word salvation and see what he's talking about. We have three different aspects of our salvation. There's a past, a present, and a future aspect of our salvation. So the past aspect is called justification. Who has heard that word before, justification? Oh, y'all should raise your hands. I talk about that. Justification. That means it's, we have been justified in Christ. We have been declared innocent because of the atoning work of Christ. And nothing we do here, nothing I do now, can change the work that Christ did for me. If I've surrendered my life to Christ, nothing I do now can change that. So that's the past aspect of salvation. The present aspect is sanctification. And this is the process of growing with Christ. Right, as we're walking with Christ and we're becoming more and more like Christ, that's sanctification. That's the present aspect. So then we have over here is we have the future aspect of salvation, and that's glorification. Right, that's when we die, we receive our glorified bodies, and we are no longer marred with sin and death. Right, we have reached the pinnacle of Christ's likeness at that point. So when we look at this word salvation, and Paul says, work out your salvation, we need to make sure we know which one we're talking about. So we know that it's not justification because nothing I do can change that I've been justified. Okay? And then we look at glorification. Well, I know there's nothing I can do because I only get that when I'm dead. Right? When, I, when I'm standing in front of Christ and I have received my glorified body, nothing I do now is going to change that glorified body. And so that only leaves us with sanctification. So when Paul says to work out your salvation, he means a process of becoming more like Christ. Just like he says in verse 127, chapter 1, verse 27, only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Saying live a life worthy of Christ. If you have Christ, live like it. 2 Peter 1.10 says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So when they tell us that we need to work out our salvation or we need to confirm our calling or our election, what are they telling us to do? Tony Morita, he's a, a pastor up in Raleigh and he works at Southeastern the Seminary. He said this, but to work out your salvation simply means to follow the example of Christ. In the Christ hymn, Jesus has given us the pattern for obedience. He has shown us what humble, others-focused, God-glorifying obedience looks like. That's the kind of life we are called to live as a believer. Does your life look like Philippians 2, 6 through 8? If you have your Bibles open, take a second, look down and read Philippians 2, 6 through 8.
Remember, this is the great example of humility that the world has ever seen. Does your life look like that? Does your life look like a life sold out for the Lord in obedience and love for him? It is our duty to work out what God has worked in us. John MacArthur said it this way, Paul is not speaking of attaining salvation by human effort or goodness, but of living out the inner transformation that God has graciously granted. So if God has filled you with the Holy Spirit, if you've been saved, that means God has filled you with the Holy Spirit. If that's you, then you have an obligation to live that out. Right, and we don't go from being a, a wretched sinner that's damned to hell to perfect glorification like that. Right, there's no shortcut. All right, and if any of y'all in here use essential oils, I'm not knocking on them, we use them, they're great. But just because you put some frankincense on your head does not mean you get to skip the whole sanctification process. Right, there's no shortcut in sanctification, it's work. So as we look at sanctification a little bit, I want to explain there's two, um, there's more than two views, but the two views are the far left and the far right when we think about sanctification. Over here on the far left, you have what's called quietism. Has anybody ever heard that term before? Quietism? Yeah, I don't think I had until I was studying for this. But quietism, this is a more passive view of sanctification, right? This is where I would just totally surrender to God. I would let go and let God. Has anybody heard that before? Just let go and let God. I think just a couple weeks ago I saw that moving around Facebook or something like that. I, I would probably classify this phrase, let go and let God, under the stupid things that Christians say. All right, and so let me, let me explain why. If you look in Exodus 14, you don't have to flip there, I'll, I'll read it to you. Exodus 14, verse 13 and 14 says, And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. So if we stop right there, then this quietism is sounding pretty good. Right? We stop right there. Moses said, just be still, be silent, and watch the Lord. And so what I want to do real quick is I want to see how this would play out. Right, so right now, I'm just going to let go, and I'm going to let God, okay? This would be a really awkward 30 minutes, wouldn't it? If I just sat here and, and just let go and let God. Right, so, so let's keep reading. For some reason, it didn't work. Maybe I did it wrong, but let's see what Moses says here in verse 15 and 16. It says, the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. So I guess quietism won't work for us, right? The Lord makes it very clear right here to Moses. Don't just stand there. You need to go forward. Moses, you need to lift up your staff to part the sea so they can walk through. Then I will deliver you. So then if we're, if we're not going to be over here in the quietism, we'll go all the way to the other side, right? It's called pietism. And so what we have over here is a, a much more aggressive approach to, to seeking moral, moral, not purification, um, moral purity. So what I'm looking for, we're seeking moral purity, right? So it's all about what I do to become more pure, right? And, and this side tends to be prideful, legalistic, arrogant, right? Self-righteous, judgmental. So if you're all the way over here, that's, that's what you're going to be like. Because to you, you're doing everything in this process of sanctification. You're doing all the work. And so, you know, I make a list. Man, I did this. I went to church today. I read my Bible this morning. I prayed. I said hello to somebody and I was nice to them. Right? So we'd write all these things down that said, I am more holy. Right? And I, I think... And I don't think this is just Americans, but what we are really good at is taking something and going all the way to the extreme with it, one way or the other. So we'll have people all the way over here that, that may not say out loud, let go and let God. But what we see is in the church, Big C Church, so all of them, what we see is people who think, well, okay, I'm saved, I'm good. I did all I had to do, God's going to do the rest, I'm good, right? I come to church on Sunday, I don't have to do anything else, right? And so we'll take it all the way to the extreme. I've done everything that I needed to do, now I can be saved. But then you'll have people all the way to the other side. And this, all the way over here in pietism, this is how probably most people view a Baptist church. 
right? Self-righteous, judgmental, prideful, arrogant. And so we're really good at going to one side or the other, but we have to be careful not to do that. We have to come into the middle and find this middle ground. But it's obvious that Paul's telling us that we have work to do, right? Work out your salvation. And James says the same thing. Don't just be hearers of the word, be doers. Then he goes on, a faith without works is dead. And so I look over here to this side and I see a faith without works, right? I've been saved, I don't have to do anything. That's a dead faith. So we want to avoid that. But then we have to be careful not to come over here and be too prideful with, with all this stuff that we do and how holy and mature we are as Christians. But don't worry, Paul's going to clear this up for us in verse 13, and we'll come back to that in a second. But let's look at this last phrase in verse 12. With fear and trembling, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So I look at these words, and the word fear is, is phobos, is where we get phobia from. A phobia, fear of something, terror. And the trembling is, is tromos. I lucked out because they sounded the same, so it was easy for me to pronounce them. It's where we get the word tremor from. So terror and tremor. Exodus 20, 18 through 20, it shows a good example of this. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear for God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you that you may not sin. Don't be scared, but God's here, so you'll have a fear of them, right? And they were trembling. And I don't think, for the most part, that we view God this way. I don't think we approach God with fear and trembling. You see shirts and stickers that say stuff like, Jesus is my homeboy, right? Or Jesus is my co-pilot. I don't know about you, but Jesus is not my homeboy, and he's not my co-pilot. If it's my homeboy, I'm not going to stand and tremble in front of him, right? I'm not going to be scared of him. If I'm that scared of him, I'm not going to be around him. He's not going to be my homeboy. And I definitely don't want to be scared of my co-pilot if I'm flying, right? And so, but we typically view Jesus this way, just a nonchalant, yeah, Jesus is my friend, and yeah, man, he's my homeboy. But that's the exact opposite of the way we're supposed to approach him. And it, it's a little bit different for us than the Israelites. We're not standing at the mountain with the presence of God surrounding it with a fear that if we touch the mountain, we're going to die. Right? He's talking to believers, and so we don't need to be scared that if we mess up, God's going to send us to hell. Right? Remember, justification, we're justified. If you're in Christ, then you're secure. So we don't need to fear it that way. John MacArthur says, this kind of fear and trembling is closely related to both obedience to the Lord and to love and affection for him and for fellow believers. And so I think I saw a little glimpse of this in, in my son Wesley the other night. So we were putting the kids to bed and typically I'll go in one room, Laurie will go in the other and then we'll switch. And so I'm laying in the bed with Faith and she asked me about something she saw on TV about somebody pushing down on somebody's chest. And so she was talking about CPR. And so I started explaining it to her. She's like, well, why would they do it? And so I'm going through, well, you got the heart pumps the blood and gives oxygen to the organs and all this. And she's just soaking it up and she's loving it. Um, and so I go through all that with her. And then as soon as I go into Wesley's room, the first thing he says to me, hey, daddy, tell me what you told Faith about the heart and the blood and, and pumping on the chest, right? If I tell her something, he's got to know what it is. And so I think, well, okay, she loved it. Let me, let me talk to him about it. And so we're laying there and I'm going through it. And he's like, well, why would you do that? And I said, well, if somebody dies and their heart stops, then, you know, you'd push on his chest and this and that. And, and, and then he starts getting upset and starts crying a little bit. And I'm like, Wesley, what's the matter? Well, I don't, I don't want my heart to stop beeping. He says beeping. You heard that right, beeping. He doesn't want his heart to stop beeping. And I'm like, well, Wesley, you know, you don't really have to worry about that. That typically happens when, you know, if somebody drowns or they choke or something like that. So then he gets a little concerned that his shirt's going to choke him, right? He's like, well, what if I choke in my shirt? And I'm like, Wesley, you're six years old. You've worn a shirt almost every day of your life to sleep. You're going to be okay. Well, he's still upset about it. And so I'm like, fine, then just take your shirt off. You don't have to sleep in a shirt. It's okay. And so I, I try to calm him down, and I think I got him to, to go to bed. And so I go and lay down. Like a minute later, you hear him. He's very heavy-footed. He's all the way to the room, and so I'm ready for it. And he comes in, he's upset. And he wants to sleep in our bed. That's really why he's going through all this, because he wants to sleep in our bed, and I already told him no. And so he comes in, and he's upset about it. 
and well, you know, I don't want my heart to stop beeping, and my heart's, my heart's beeping slow, and why is it doing that? And so I'm trying to talk him through as well when you're, you're resting, and so your heart beats slower, and it doesn't need to be as fast, and going through all this. And then, well, I want to sleep in your bed. No, go to bed now, and don't get back up. And so he goes away. And you know your kids cry, right? Everybody knows their kids cry. You know when it's real, and you know when it's fake. And so as he leaves, he really steps it up a notch in his crying. Right? Normally, his cry is a little bit quiet, but you know he's doing it. But now he's like, ah, ah, all the way to his room. And so my frustration level went to mildly frustrated to I want to strangle that kid. Right? I mean, it went from like two to ten like that. And so I, Laurie's like, I got it. I'm like, no, I got it. And so I jump and I, I go and I'm walking and I, I get to the end of the kitchen and he stops. So I'm like, okay, maybe he's done. And I wait for about 15, 20 seconds. Nothing. So I turn around. As soon as I turn around, he starts back. So, man, I'm, I'm in there like lightning. And I'm like, Wesley Robert Couch, if you don't stop, I'm going to spank you and I'm going to take away all your cotton balls. Right? We do a little reward system with cotton balls in a jar. Thank you, Garcias, for that. And so, and so he stops. And I'm like, all right, good. I won't have to spank him. I won't have to take all his stuff. And so I go to my room and lay down. A minute later, here he comes. So now, Laurie, she's, she knows when to take over. And so now he walks in, she's like, I got it. And she's like, Wesley, come up here and sit down. And for some reason, God has gifted her with an uncanny ability to talk to kids and explain things to them. He did not gift me with that. Anytime I try to talk to our kids about anything remotely serious, they end up crying. Right? No joke. This is not the first time it's happened. So thank God he's, he put her in my life to, to work this out for me. And so she starts explaining this to him. And all she does is say everything that I've already said. And so I don't know if it's a tone or, you know, I, I don't know what it is. Maybe he's just a mama's boy and he just wants to hear it from her. It's comforting. I don't know. But she calmed him down finally, right? And he knows I'm frustrated with him. I just got done yelling at him, so he knows I'm frustrated with him. And before he walks out, he goes, well, I want to snuggle with daddy one more time. Well, I can't say no to that, regardless of how mad I am with him. But, but I was thinking about that as I was going through this, this kind of fear and trembling. Like, he's not... He's not scared that I'm going to kill him, right? Or he's probably not even that scared that I'm going to spank him. We don't spank him very often. But he wants to be around me. And even in those times where he does get in a lot of trouble, he wants to be comforted by me right away. And so it's that fear and trembling that I saw in him. It's this reverential awe that we have for God or that maybe we look up to with our parents because they're our parents. And, and just like me when I was little... I, I was like eight or nine, and I dropped a cup in our bathtub, and it shattered. My mom was at work, and I was, I was a total mama's boy, right? And so I never wanted to disappoint my mom. And I broke this cup, and I was so upset. I was crying. I called her at work. I'm so sorry. And, and I wasn't scared that she was going to spank me. I was scared that I disappointed her. I didn't want her to think down on me or to, th to think bad things about me because I loved her, and she was my mom. I mean, she was everything. She did everything for us, and she was always there. So this is how we need to view God, with fear and trembling. We need to look at our sanctification, working out our salvation, with this fear and trembling. It's not this nonchalant type thing that we just go through life and it happens. We have to put effort into it and fear that we're going to disappoint a holy and loving God that gave his son for us. So Paul tells them, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so we all know, I want to make it very clear, we have a responsibility in that. We have a responsibility to work out what God has worked in. You see, even in Colossians 3, he says, put to death what is earthly in you. Put to death, kill it. Ephesians 4, put off your old self and put on your new self. Right, over and over, Paul's telling them, you need to do this, you have to do this. Just like God did with Moses, raise your staff, have them go forward. So we must run the race and not sit idly by. However, before you're thinking, yeah, man, I'm doing all that. I'm good. Let's take a look at verse 13. Number two, God is responsible for your salvation. And you're thinking, well, you just said we were responsible for it. Yeah, you are responsible for it. But God is responsible for it. Verse 13, Paul says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And I, I don't know about y'all, but verse 13 comes as a huge relief. Because if you just think about your salvation or your sanctification, 
Who in here would say, man, I got it. I'm doing everything like I'm supposed to do. I am good in my sanctification. Well, great. Then all of y'all should feel the same way that I do. This should come as a relief because it's not just us. Paul comforts them here by telling them, yeah, you have to work out your salvation for it is God who works in you. These first three words here in verse 13, we typically we just read over and not think much of it. And I'm pretty sure every Bible translation in here has these first three words, for it is. Because I looked up like six and they all had it. For it is. And it doesn't look like much, but Paul's making a very emphatic statement here. Right? A very forward statement. He's telling them, for it is God who works in you. Yeah, work out your salvation. For it's God who's working in you. He's saying, verse 12 is only possible because of verse 13. We can only work out our salvation because it's God who's working in us. So yeah, we have a responsibility but we're only able to fulfill that responsibility because of God. We're saved by grace through faith, right? So I put my trust in the Lord. I give my life over. I respond in faith. So I had a part in that, didn't I? Who gave me the faith to begin with? I'm only able to take that step of faith because God gave me that faith. So it has nothing to do with me. It's only because God has given me the ability to do it. Does that clear everything up for you? You have to do it, but God does it, but you have to do it. It's clear as mud, right? I told you either it was going to clear it up or it was going to make it even harder. But God is at work within us, right? He's not alongside us, encouraging us like a coach or our co-pilot or our homeboy, right? He's working within us. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Man, that's a relief. That this is God who's doing the work within me. All he wants me to do is be obedient. He's already given me the ability to do it. Let me give you another quote from John MacArthur. Fear the more quotes I give you from John MacArthur, the better my sermon is. So you, you got you to gotta bear with me. It is God who is at work in the lives of his children. He calls them to obey and then, through his sovereign power, empowers their obedience. He calls them to his service and then empowers their service. He calls them to holiness and then empowers them to pursue holiness. So it's God at work in us. This word work is where we get our word energy from. God is giving us the energy to do the things that he wants us to do. And I was reading through Exodus this week, and I saw a great example of this. And it hit me last night as I was driving home. Exodus 35, verses 30 through 35. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahis Ahisamach, of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twisted linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. So at the end of Exodus 35, you have right before that, God telling them all the things they need to make, right? All the robes and, and the, the, the tent of meeting and all this stuff, he's telling them how to set it up. He's given them the work. And now we see him give them the skill or the ability to do it. It's no different with us. God has given us the work, but he's also given us the ability to do it. Galatians 3, 3 through 5. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So Paul's dealing with the Galatian heresy, which is, I need Jesus plus my works to get into heaven. And he's saying, are you so foolish that you think be, being started with the Spirit that you're going to do anything in your own flesh to make it better? 
Romans 7, 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. So Paul's saying, I have the desire to do what's right. I want to, but I don't have the ability to do it. Only God can give us that ability. And everybody knows where, you know where you struggle. Right? Everybody knows the, the main areas that they struggle with. And so what we do is we build up walls around that. Right? So we don't overstep. Right? I, I don't even want to get close to where I know that I would mess up. And so we'll build walls. And we all, we all have these struggles. Because we don't, we build the walls because we don't want to disobey God. But I don't want to come before the Lord and say, I know you wanted me to do this, but, you know, I messed up and I went and did this. We want to protect ourselves, but we're only able to do that because God has changed our heart. He's filled us with the Spirit and given us a desire to do what's right. So verse 13 ends with, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God gives us the will that produces the holy work, but only God is able to produce in us the will and the work that he's commanded to have and do. And here what, here's what blows my mind. It's for his good pleasure. Have you ever thought about your obedience is pleasing to the Lord? Which means your disobedience is not pleasing to the Lord. And I'm reading through this and I'm thinking, man... This is God. I can please God by being obedient? That's why he's given us the ability and the desire to do what he's called us to do. Because it pleases him. Let me, let me leave you with, with these thoughts. Even though this, this... Us working out our salvation may be hard to wrap your mind around. Right? Like, I have to do the work but it's God doing the work in me, but I still have a responsibility, but only because of God, and I have to do this in God. Right? It may be kind of hard to understand, but God was also fully man and fully God. Try to explain that. Try to explain that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all the same, but they're all different. Right? Some, some things we're going to come across in Scripture are hard to explain. And Paul doesn't really try to harmonize these two. Right? He doesn't really try to explain it. You need to do the work, but it's God that's working in you. But the good thing about that is that's why God's God. He's infinite. We're not ever going to be able to understand everything about God because he's too big. But what is very clear is that we must work diligently, taking up our cross daily, persevering in the work that God has given us to do. And after we've done all that, after we've done everything that God has commanded us to do, we need... It'd be very wise to heed the words of Jesus here in Luke 17, 10. So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. What a humble approach to our sanctification. Yeah, I know that I have to take responsibility in my sanctification. But then I know I'm only doing what I've been commanded to do. Right? I, don't, I don't need to receive kudos for what I do in the Lord. I'm only doing what I was called to do in the first place. Would a, and I should have put the verse in here, I just thought about it. Would a slave who, who sets a table and cleans the table, would they expect a thank you from their master? No, they're doing what they were supposed to do. And so we need to think about it the same way. We approach the Lord with fear and trembling, seeking to be obedient in everything we do with a humble attitude. Pray with me. Father God, we praise you this morning. We praise you for who you are. We praise you for how big you are. Lord, I ask that you would continue to mold our hearts. Lord, help us to not be lazy in our approach to you. Lord, help us to not be irreverent in our approach to you. Lord, help us to not be prideful or self-righteous or judgmental. Lord, help us to seek only to obey you with a humble spirit. Lord, as we are only doing what you have commanded us to do. 
Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that your word will resonate on our hearts this week as we go out and seek to do what you've called us to do. Father, we love you. We praise you for all that you are. It's your holy name I pray. Amen.